Many real-world applications of stochastic processes revolve around the statistical properties of the time until a particular event occurs. In insurance, for example, where benefits are paid to a policyholder while he or she is sick, or a sum assured is paid to beneficiaries upon death, from the perspective of the company selling such a product, um, the expected time until death occurs, or the expected time an individual remains sick or an illness reoccurs, uh, is at least of equal interest to the probability of simply observing death or illness. Were we to model such a process using a mark of chain with three states, say alive, sick or dead, uh, we could easily actually quantify such temporally related events statistically using the analysis of so-called first passage time events. Now the premise here is that we are not merely interested in the statistical properties of the process as it pertains to the state space. So that is, what is the probability that the process occupies a particular state at any particular time? But also, the time until a particular event relating to a state is observed. So the focus shifts from random events in state to random events in time. So for this video, what we're going to do is we're going to cover first passage time problems for Markov chains, and we'll look at two modes of analyzing first passage time problems. The first concerns an algorithmic approach, uh, which gives us a recursive procedure for calculating first passage time probabilities up to finite transition horizons. And the second concerns an analytical approach um, to analyzing first passage time problems in a more general fashion. So let's jump in. So although there are lots of interesting temporal event types we could consider, one that shows up quite often in practical applications is so-called first passage, and in the present context, also first return events. These are defined as follows. First passage from state i to state j, where j is not equal to i, in k steps occurs when the process is in state i at time s for some reference point s, and then k steps later, the process is in state j at time s plus k, but such that the process may not assume the state j for all of the interim time points between times s and s plus k. Okay, so similarly, uh, first return is defined as the event that the process is in state i at time s for some reference point s. Um, and then again, k steps later, the process is in state i, so it returns to that state uh, at time s plus k, but such that the process may not assume the state k i for any of the interim steps between s and s plus k. Okay, so first passage or return as the name suggests, simply concerns subsets of all of the possible trajectories of the process, um, subject to the constraint that it simply transitions or returns to a particular state for the first time. Okay. Now, clearly these events are contingent on the trajectory of the process. Since the trajectory of the process is random, any such contingent events will also be random and have an associated distribution. So to see this, let's consider the following random variable. Let's define tau ij to be the minimum number of steps t greater than or equal to naught, such that the process is in state j at time s plus t, given that it started in state i at time s. So tau ij here clearly defines a first passage time variable in terms of the number of steps. Now, depending on the trajectory of the process, obviously, starting from the reference point s, um, this time can take on values, say, 1, so it can happen in one step, 2, 3, and so on. Okay. And each of these events will have an associated probability. Now, consequently, we define the so-called first passage probabilities as fij argument k is simply the probability that tau ij assumes the value k for some integer k. Now, I've just included a footnote here. For time homogeneous processes, the reference point won't matter much. Um, the distribution will look the same, um, and S will only be relevant for reference to the zero point in whatever problem you're working on. Okay, so for convenience, we'll just treat the reference point as zero going forward. Okay, now, important as though they are, these probabilities are often very difficult to evaluate, for at least for most stochastic processes. But fortunately, in the context of Markov chains, uh, we have rather elegant strategies for extracting the relevant statistics. So as it turns out, we can easily calculate the first passage time distribution recursively, provided that we have access to the transition probabilities. So to see this, we decompose the transition probabilities in terms of the first passage time probabilities as follows. Okay, so 
the probability of transitioning from state i to state j in, say, k steps is just equal to the sum over all r running from naught to k, so again where k is the number of steps, of the probability of first passage from state i to state j in r steps, where r is the index of the sum, multiplied by the probability of transitioning from state j back to state j in k minus r steps, k minus r being the remaining number of steps from r. Okay, now this expression may seem bewildering at first, but the intuition is as follows. So the process, suppose the process transitions from state i to state j in k steps. So we'll assume a reference point in time here is just zero for convenience. Either first passage occurred at the last step, okay, because the process is in k, or it happened in some interim point in time, call that point in time r, and the process then returned to j in the remaining number of steps. Now, that gives us the product of the probabilities in the summation. But obviously, this interim point could have been at any point up to and including k. Okay, so moving to state k has to move there first. At some point in time, that point in time could be anywhere between 0 and k. So hence, uh, we decompose the probability of transitioning from state i to state j in terms of these disjoint events, and we sum over the appropriate probabilities um, to give us the transition probability and consequently the relation. Now what's cool about this expression is that it results in a simple triangular system of equations which we can solve for the first passage time probabilities. This can be seen by evaluating this expression along k running from 1, 2, 3, etc. Okay, so let's consider the first element. So the probability of transitioning from state i to state j in one step, how can that happen? Well, that's just the probability of first passage happening in zero steps multiplied by the probability of transitioning from state j back to state j in the remaining number of steps, so one step. Um, alternatively, um, first passage could have occurred in one step, okay, so plus the probability of first passage from state i to state j in one step, multiplied by the probability of transitioning from state j back to state j in the zero number, remaining number of steps. Okay, now obviously the first term in this summation will be zero, um, because we define the initial condition that um, the probability of first passage in zero steps is going to be zero. Okay, furthermore, um, maybe from earlier, we stated that the probability of returning to a particular state in zero steps is going to be 1. So what we'll see is that, well, the probability of first passage in one step from state i to state j is just the transition probability from state i to state j in one step. Okay, okay so that takes care of k equals 1. Now we can obviously go along and look at k2, 3, etc. So let's look for example at k2. So the probability of transitioning from state i to state j in two steps, how could that have occurred? Well, either first passage occurs in zero steps and the process returns in the remaining two steps. Okay. Alternatively, first passage occurs in one step and process just returns in the remaining step. Um, or alternatively, first passage occurs at the second step and return in the zero remaining steps. Okay, and then we can obviously plug in the initial conditions. Okay, so Obviously, assuming that we have the transition probabilities and we're looking for the first passage probabilities in these expressions, uh, we can thus recursively evaluate these equations to find the probabilities for a finite set k. Okay. Um, and such a strategy constitutes an algorithmic approach to analyzing first passage, which is satisfactory for most practical applications. Uh, and we can also follow a similar procedure to calculate first return probabilities. Now indeed, in computational contexts, um, the calculations are actually relatively straightforward using this approach. So for example, let's consider calculating first passage probabilities uh, for moving from say state one to three over a finite transition horizon, we'll call it k running from one to all the way up to some chosen k max, and for a three-state Markov chain uh, with the following transition matrix. Okay, now an algorithm for calculating uh, the first passage probabilities would be as follows. First, we calculate the, relative the relevant transition probabilities using the recursive expression for the unconditional distributions. Okay, so remember we had that 
vector um, delta transpose k equals delta transpose k minus 1 post multiplied by gamma. And we can evaluate that expression for k running up from 1, 2, all the way up to some chosen k max. Okay, now we'll just have to pick the appropriate initial distributions so that we retrieve the transition probabilities, not the unconditionals, um, and then extract the last element in that vector corresponding to the Hurst state. Okay, melt the okay. So once we have those probabilities, well, then we can use our recursive relation to evaluate the first passage time probability. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by simply rearranging the expression from before um, to arrive at the explicit recursive expression for the first passage probability from state i to state 3 in k steps where k runs from 1 to all the way up to k max. Okay, and we'll find that as the probability of first passage from state 1 to state 3 in k steps is just the transition probability of state from moving from of transition probability from state 1 to state 3 in k steps minus the sum of all r running from naught to k minus 1. So if you rearrange the expression, you'll see why that happens. Um, over all first passage probabilities from state 1 to 3 in r steps, where r is the index of that sum, multiplied by the probability of transitioning from state 3 to state 3 in the remaining number of steps, k minus r. Okay, so nice explicit recursive expression. Now indeed, this is really easy to code. And we'll cover this in a separate lab session, um, but for the time being, you can just check out the code on screen. Uh, we have done the calculation for our example chain up to some conveniently chosen uh, k max. And perhaps as expected, plotting the resulting probabilities, we see a skewed discrete distribution. Also, we can do a quick sanity check on these probabilities by noting that for this particular chain, if the chain starts, for example, in state 1, uh, it will take at least two steps to get to state 3. Okay, remember, we're interested in the first, passi first passage from state 1 to state 3. Okay, so, well, we can just then read off from the transition probabilities matrix. Okay, well, the probability of first passage in one step is thus 0. Okay, first passage in two steps can also only occur in one way. Okay, the probability of that event must be 0.1 times 0.3. Okay, which we can again read off from the transition probability matrix. So printing the first four elements in our calculation using the recursion reveals the appropriate probabilities. Okay, so as a little exercise, which you can do if you can see if you can explain by inspection what the probability of first passage in three steps would be, for example, i.e. the fourth element that we printed. Okay, and that concludes our Twig example. Uh, we'll maybe revisit it in a lab session. Now, uh, using the algorithmic approach, uh, we can approximate useful statistics, such as the mean and the variance of the first passage time, uh, but we have to be very careful in how we pick k max, so i.e. the finite transition horizon over which we evaluate the recursive procedure. Uh, since we're essentially truncating the probabilities beyond k max, uh, we're ignoring events beyond that horizon. And obviously, we can't just keep on evaluating those recursive expressions, at some stage we're going to run down of computation time or memory. Okay, so um, good practice um, for this might be to then, well, okay, let's pick a k-max um, such that, well, if we sum up all the probabilities, we can check whether they are close to 1. So in that way, you'll know that you've accounted for most of the probability content in the distribution, so the first passage time distribution, and consequently you'll diminish the effects of any errors introduced by truncation at k-max. Uh, but nevertheless, you have to be very careful, and most of your statistics will be slightly biased. So using recursive equations is great for computational analysis, but for classification purposes, where we need to make claims about the first passage time distributions over non-finite transition horizons, uh, we'll need stronger mathematical machinery. So for these purposes, we resort to using generating functions. So I've adapted the following a definition from a second year probability theory textbook that I have. Okay, so let x be a non-negative integer-valued random variable with distribution p x. Okay, so that just gives us the probability that the random variable x assumes the value x. Um, then the function g s, which is just the sum of r running from naught to infinity of the probability of the pro of x assuming r um, multiplied by s to the power r, which is just the expectation of s to the power x is the so-called probability generating function of x. Now, uh, 
I'll simply use generating function since it should be clear from the context uh, when we are dealing with discrete or continuous random variables. So for this video, uh, I actually mean probability generating function whenever I say generating function. Um, and then we note two important properties of the probability generating functions. Okay, first is the series converges for uh, absolute value of s less than or equal to one, and this follows since the probabilities have to sum to one. Indeed, it's a distribution. Um, and then perhaps more importantly, gs uh, determines the probabilities uniquely. Okay, so now what that means is that uh, random variables with the same generating function have the exact same distribution. Simple as that. So the principle behind generating functions is that we collect all of the information about the probabilities associated with the distribution in a single expression. Indeed, if we can write down the expression for the generating function, we only ever need to store the expression in order to later extract the probabilities, moments, and other statistics that we're after. Okay. So this is obviously useful when you're dealing with difficult random variables or where the distribution has a non-finite support, kind of like the case we were in. Indeed, David Sturzaker writes, you can think of such functions, so these are generating functions and moment generating functions, as organizers which store a collection of objects that they will later regurgitate on demand. Remarkably, uh, they will often produce other information if differently stimulated. Thus, the probability generating function will produce the moments and the moment generating function will produce the probability distribution in most cases. Um, furthermore, these functions are particularly adept at handling sequences, sums, and collections of random variables, i.e. difficult random variables. So for where we're going, um, we'll be exploiting the power of generating functions to tighten up the analysis of first passage time problems for Markov chains. Cool, so in order to get an appropriate expression for the generating function of the first passage time distribution, we'll have to derive an interim result first. Uh, which I will henceforth refer to as the uh, pseudo-generating function or collection of pseudo-generating functions. Okay, so let's define capital PIJS is just the sum of t running from naught to infinity of the probabilities of transitioning from state i to state j in t steps multiplied by some variable s um, to the power t. Okay, and we'll define that for all pairs i and j in Cal U. Okay, now so this sort of looks like a generating function but do note, this is not a proper generating function, since the probability content does not relate to a random variable which assumes values in the index. Okay, so the expression does calculate or does carry the transition probabilities relating to the state of the process, that's the random variable, um, over a non-finite transition horizon, uh, which is useful mathematically, but this is not a proper generating function. Okay, note further that S here does not denote a reference point but rather it's just an argument of the function which acts as a dummy variable um, in the summation um, as it would in a standard generating function. So apologies for the overlap in notation, um, but I think it's good to stick with the convention where generating functions are concerned. Okay, so if we collect the elements, capital PIJS in a U by U matrix, we'll call this boldface capital PS, uh, we may derive an expression for this matrix of pseudo-generating functions in terms of the transition probability matrix, specifically the one-step transition probability matrix. Okay, so to see this, let's define. Boldface PS is just a matrix with all of its elements uh, being the pseudo-generating functions for states i to state i to j. Okay, that's just from the definition. Well, next what we can do is, well, let's substitute the expression for each of those PIJS and well, what do we end up with? Well, we just end up with a matrix um, indicated by our square brackets um, of infinite series. So each of the elements is an infinite series, um, which is our pseudo generating function uh, definition. Okay, now noting that that's each of the elements is an infinite series. Well, if you look at how matrix addition works, you may as well argue, okay, well, we could just in add or we could just calculate a summation over an infinite set of matrices, right? Okay, so we take the square brackets in to denote that we're summing over an infinite series of matrices where each of those matrices uh, along the index is just the t-step transition probability matrix. Okay, so matrix of sums, sum of matrices, and those matrices are the t-step transition probabilities. Okay, now 
Next thing we note is, well, what's the relationship between the one-step transition probability matrix and the t-step transition probability matrix? Well, if gamma is, just, or boldface gamma is just a one-step transition probability matrix, t-step transition probability matrix is whatever that is to the power t. Okay, so we power up that matrix and we end up with an infinite sum running from t, uh, t running from naught to infinity of boldface gamma to the power t times the real s to the power t. Um, okay, and we can collect those two terms together. And what do we end up with? A nice little infinite series of a very familiar form. Okay, now as it happens, uh, from the world of linear algebra, we can actually write down expression for that infinite series. Okay, and that is just the identity matrix um, of the same dimensions as gamma, uh, minus s to the s times the one-step transition probability matrix, and then we have to ver invert that expression. Now, obviously, because this is an infinite series, uh, we have some convergence criterion which we need to satisfy, and that is that, well, that series will converge if the absolute value of the eigenvalues of gamma times s are less than 1. Okay, and there you have it. Uh, we have an expression for calculating the matrix of pseudo-generating functions from the one-step transition probability matrix, which will become useful shortly. Okay, so define now the generating function for first passage from state i to state j as capital Fijs is just uh, the probability of first passage from state i to state j in k steps multiplied by the argument s to the power k, uh, and then we sum over k running from naught to infinity. Okay, now this is a proper generating function since it relates to a random variable tau ij. Also, it carries the first passage time probabilities over a non-finite support, and we hope to find expressions for the various for the various Fijs in terms of elementary functions. Okay, now we don't have the probabilities, so the first passage time probabilities, f i j k at hand, um, and it's clear that our recursive strategy won't be of much use if applied directly here because we can only evaluate those probabilities up to a certain point, so we can't plug them into that summation, look at how the function behaves and try and guess an expression for it, um, it just won't work. Um, but what we can do is we can actually exploit the pseudo-generating function via the recursive relations from earlier in order to derive expressions for the Fijs analytically. Okay, so for example, in the case of first passage from state i to state j, uh, where uh, i is obviously not equal to j, um, we have that capital Fijs is just capital Pijs divided by capital Pjjs, where uh, Pijs and capital Pjjs are just the elements read off from the pseudo matrix of pseudo generating functions. Okay, so remember we have an expression, an exact expression for that. We derive that expression, we can just read off the elements from there, and we can plug it in there, and that'll give us an analytical expression uh, for the generating function capital Fijs. Okay, now obviously we need to prove this relationship, and as it turns out, this relationship is which is not that difficult to prove. Um, so here goes. Let's consider um, capital Pijs. Okay, now from our definition, that's just, okay, pseudo-generating functions, so probability of transitioning from state i to state j in t steps, multiplied by the argument s to the power t, and then we have the index t running from naught to infinity, and we sum over all of those. Okay, so pseudo-generating function. Right, so next thing we want to do, I said, well, we're going to exploit the pseudo-generating, or well, I guess the relation, the recursive relation from earlier. Um, well, that recursive relation is only valid for an index running from 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to quickly expand this sum, chuck away the first term, and then we'll have that our index starts running from 1. Okay, so we'll have an infinite series running from 1 to infinity. Then what we can do is, well, we can just substitute the expression for the recursive relation between um, the transition probabilities and the first passage probabilities, plug that into our summation. Okay, so we end up with this double summation, uh, where the one index runs from 1 to infinity, and the uh, inner index runs from R naught, run, runs from naught to T, so the index of the outer summation. Okay, so we know what these expressions look like. What can we do next? Um, okay, so we can take the s into that uh, summation, and then what we're going to do is we're going to break up that s into s to the power r times s to the power t minus r. Now, um, that's the exact same expression. Um, the only idea here is to get those indices for uh, 
the elements of the inner summation to match those powers. Okay, and the reason we want to do that is uh, looking at the structure of the summation, particularly this double summation, um, if we can get it in a particular form, we can exploit a result to write it as a product of two infinite series. Okay, only thing we need to do that is to have that, well, we need the first index to run from zero. Okay, now we have it running from one, how do we fix that? Well, as it turns out, we just add a zero and we're going to use the argument that, well, uh, first passage or the probability of first passage in zero steps is going to be zero. Um, and the probability of moving from j to j in zero steps is going to be one, one times zero, zero. Um, and well, yeah, so we add a zero and we can change the index of that sum. And then what we have is we have a double summation in a familiar form. Okay, and then we can exploit a result which states that we can rewrite the, that expression, this double summation, as the product of two infinite series. So we start with an infinite series, which is a double summation, um, and then we write it as the product of two infinite series. Okay, so you can go check out the Cauchy product to see what that's all about. Um, in any case, in any exam conditions, this will typically be given to you. Or assumed no. Okay, and what do we see? Well, for the um, first infinite series that we end up with, uh, we just have the probability of first passage from state i to state j in k steps multiplied by the argument s to the power k, and then we sum over k running from naught to infinity. Okay, so that looks familiar. That is just the generating capital generating function capital Fijs. Also, uh, the second summation, if we look at that, um, what do we see? Well, that's just the probability of transitioning from state j to j in l steps multiplied by the argument to the power l, um, and then we sum over t running from naught to infinity. Okay, well, that's just our pseudo-generating function, right? But for state j. Okay, and what do we see? Um, okay, well, we end up with the following expression. So capital Pijs is just capital Fijs multiplied by capital Jjs. And then we can solve for capital Ijs. And that concludes the proof. Okay, so simple as that. Okay, so similarly, in the case of first return, say for state i, uh, we can derive an expression relating the uh, generating function of the first return distribution um, to the pseudo-generating functions as um, Fiis is just 1 minus 1 divided by capital Pis. Okay, um, and the proof for that follows similarly. Okay, so under this analytical approach, uh, we can derive closed form expression for the generating function of the first passage through will first return distribution by simply following, simply following uh, the steps one, derive a matrix of pseudo generating functions. So that's just, well, we have an expression for that. Two, read off the relevant expressions and then plug them into the appropriate identities. Okay, and those identities relate the pseudo generating functions to the generating functions for first passage or return. Uh, we can then use the resulting expressions to calculate statistics or distribution from the resulting generating function. Okay, so this constitutes an analytical approach in that we can identify the expressions for the generating functions of the first passage or return events, which in turn contains all of the information about those distributions. Okay, so we can thus use these to calculate statistics or analyze the behavior of the process over non-finite transition horizons analytically. So, as a concluding example, um, let's consider a two-state Markov chain. And uh, we'll have that um, the probability of transitioning from state one to state one in one step will set 2.9, and the probability of staying, transitioning from state two to state two in one step is just gonna be 0.7, obviously because this is two-state, um, those two quantities define the transition probability matrix entirely. Um, and let's say maybe, okay, let's look at calculating the matrix of pseudo-generating functions first. Okay, that's always going to be the first step in analysis of first passage or return. Okay, so we go um, the identity minus S times gamma, uh, calculate the inverse of that, and then, oh, okay, well, we end up with a matrix where we have a bunch of ratios of polynomials. Okay, uh, I guess that's that for now. And then we need to decide, okay, well, which types of events are we interested in? So let's, for example, say, uh, let's look at first passage from state one to state two. Okay, now we use the relevant identity. We read off the elements from our matrix of pseudo-generating functions. We plug them in there. 
Uh, okay, and then the expression simplifies somewhat, and we end up with an expression which is simply, say, 0.1s uh, divided by 1 minus 0.9s. Okay, cool. So we have the generating function now. What do we do now? Um, well, by the uniqueness of the probability generating function, we recognize this as a geometric alpha distribution, okay, where we sort of know what that distribution is. Okay, I don't expect you to know that. Um, you can read it up. But the point is, if we know the properties of this distribution well, uh, we could also apply them here directly. Okay, so by uniqueness of the generating function. So if we know what the mean of that distribution is in terms of that parameter, we can actually write it down explicitly. Uh, alternatively, uh, if we just can't recognize it or you know can't use it directly like that, uh, what we can do is we can just use the general result which relates the factorial moments to the generating function and indeed this is typically something I ask students in exams. Okay, and we can calculate useful statistics from that. Cool, so I hope you found that interesting. Um, first passage time problems in general can be quite slippery, um, but if you practice enough, uh, you should easily master them for Markov chains. As you can see, it's a rather formulaic procedure. Um, as always, I'll leave some homework problems on screen for you to check out, and then I'll see you in the next one.